Good evening, and welcome to the webinar, What You Need to Know About Chronic graft versus host Disease, Current Treatment Options, and Promising Research. My name is Susan Stewart. I'm the Executive Director of Blood and Marrow Transplant Information Network, or BMT InfoNet, and I'm glad to welcome you to this webinar this evening. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our organization, BMT InfoNet provides information and support services to patients and families going through transplant before, during, and after treatment. This is one of several webinars that we have sponsored throughout the year, and many more are available for viewing on our website. We also offer publications that are of interest to people before, during, and after transplant, a survivorship symposium that we host annually, and a peer support program. Uh, we encourage you to go to bmtinfonet.org and explore all of the options and to let us know if there's something we can do to help you as you go through your transplant journey. Tonight's webinar is made possible in part by a grant from Pharmacyclics and Janison, Janssen, and I want to thank them for their generous support. So without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker to you. Dr. Jagesha is the Chief of the Section of Hematology Stem Cell Transplant and the Director of the Outpatient Transplant Program at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. He's developed a long-term follow-up clinic for transplant patients with a focus on delivering efficient and effective care to transplant survivors, particularly those uh, concerned with graft-versus-host disease. Dr. Jagesh's primary research is graft-versus-host disease, and as a clinical investigator, he's actively trying to identify non-HLA genetic factors that predict development of both acute and chronic GVHD. The development of these biomarkers that predict for types of organs affected with GVHD along with response to therapy is an important aspect of his research and of great concern, I know, to people on this webinar. Dr. Jagesha is actively involved in clinical trials targeting various manifestations of chronic GVHD and is the site principal investigator for the National Chronic GVHD Consortium. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jagesha. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, and thank you for uh, everyone who's been able to uh, join on the call. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and uh, start my presentation, and as Sue mentioned, uh, please, um, you know, type your questions. We'll be answering that at the um, end of the presentation. So chronic GVHD, um, although it's considered as an orphan disease at a national level, uh, to those who have had a donor stem cell transplant, um, that this is a huge problem. Uh, the incidence of GVHD in the acute phase, which typically happens in the first three to four months after transplant, almost half of the patients that undergo a transplant will develop acute GVHD. The chance of developing chronic graft-versus-host disease will vary depending upon what type of a donor transplant a patient has had, what regimen was used, what GVHD prophylaxis was used, what donor type was selected, what was the type of the stem cells, whether it was a bone marrow or a peripheral blood stem cell product that was used. Um, but in general, the incidence varies from 30% to 70%. As the technology advances, as patients are surviving through their chronic graft-versus-host disease, it is expected that by 2020, around, we will have around 70,000 to 80,000 patients with chronic GVHD. So although the incidence may be small, patients are living longer and the prevalence of this disease keeps on increasing. <clears throat> Thus, healthcare systems, transplant programs, need to adjust uh, their workflows to take care of this larger and ever-growing number of patients with chronic GVHD. It's also important to keep in mind it is the key driver of late effects after hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So a patient usually starts a transplant with either an underlying malignancy or a non-malignant disease and we fix the underlying problem, but then we run into chronic graft-versus-host disease. And as many of you may know, this has a huge impact on quality of life. On your right side, lower uh, panel, you, you see a diagram where you've got 
The first column is disease. The second column is PCS or, physic or uh, physical uh, scale. And then on the right side is mental uh, functioning scale. The reason for this diagram is to show that patients who have severe GVHD, I'm trying to adjust my pointer over here, severe graft versus host disease, if you look at their physic, uh, physical score, this kind of black dot over here, and you follow it all the way down, they map to diseases like heart attack, congestive heart failure, hypertension. That means our patients with chronic GVHD are truly feeling as debilitated as a patient with diabetes, as a patient with, who's just recently recovering from a heart attack similar to a patient with congestive heart failure. So they really feel poorly. And if you look at their mental scores, so this is when I say the ability to focus, irritability, and those kind of things, those patients are not feeling well. So they almost feel as bad as patients with, uh, um, for example, vision impairment, hearing impairment, limitation in the movement of arms, depression. So when we hear our patients' complaints in the clinic, they are actually spot on. So these kind of studies have been done looking at quality of life, and we know that our patients with chronic graft-versus-host disease do have significant uh, impairment of quality of life. Moving on to the next slide, <coughs> um, I think one thing we all need to understand is Chronic GVHD is really complicated at a biological level. I'm not going to walk you through the cartoon on your left. What I would like to show is this diagram on the right. So imagine that we can separate our chronic graft versus host disease into multiple organ domains. We know that chronic GVHD affects the skin, the mouth, the eyes, the GI tract, the liver, the lung, joints, and fascia. And genital cross, uh, chronic graft versus host disease is an underreported manifestation of chronic GVHD. <clears throat> Patients often do not volunteer that information. Physicians and uh, healthcare providers are often not probing the patients for those questions either. The scoring of GVHD is done on a score of 0, 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> so you, uh, hopefully you can appreciate the color differences the bright red or the orange is sort of the inflammatory type of chronic GVHD where the skin is red, the mouth is sensitive, the mouth has ulcers. And as the score moves to the three, it, it becomes more sort of, I've got the color over here, more as brown, which means the more of fibrosis, the scarring type of chronic GVHD. In the skin, <clears throat> we'll call it scleroderma. In the mouth, it looks like submucosal fibrosis. In the eyes, there is destruction of the tear, uh, tear glands or the lacrimal glands, leading to often an irreversible dry eye. <clears throat> in the GI, in your food pipe, in the esophagus, we often see esophageal webs and strictures. In advanced liver GVHD, we can see cirrhosis. In the lungs, when there is scarring, we call it bronchiolitis or blood trans or lung GVHD. Joints can get entrapped with the sclerosis, and often patients develop contractures. <clears throat> Genital chronic GVHD with scarring can cause problems in having urination, vaginal discomfort, sexual dysfunction. So chronic GVHD is a complete spectrum, starting more as inflammation and the end result being just fibrosis. <clears throat> so when we looked at chronic graft versus host disease in 2014, um, the National Institute of Health had convened a group of experts to basically say, can the physician and the scientific community agree on how to diagnose it and stage it? <clears throat> I was fortunate to try, uh, lead this uh, entire sort of consensus panel on the diagnosis and staging of chronic GVHD, and we realized that this is a sort of a very heterogeneous disease. It's almost like 10 different diseases that we are forced to use just one name, i.e. chronic graft versus host disease. And when we attempted to stage it, we realized that a staging system that we would need would have to be a hybrid of looking at the patient's symptoms. How does it impair their activities of daily living? 
what are the blood test abnormalities, and what are some of the other tests, like lung function test. <clears throat> and we made a big assumption, probably a right assumption, that as the severity gets worse, the quality of life goes down. That's depicted by QOL. As the severity gets worse, the survival of the patients can be compromised, and the response rate to uh, interventions like uh, drugs or devices will go down. We also attempted to divide uh, the chronic GVHD into three categories, instead of just to kind of have three big buckets. One is called mild chronic GVHD, second is moderate chronic graft versus host disease, and three is severe chronic GVHD. I'm not going to go into the details. That's getting too much too technical. But you should be asking your physicians and say, based on the NIH consent criteria of 2014, what do you think my chronic GVHD is? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? And if they start you on a new medicine, you should ask them, what is my response based on the NIH response criteria? The criteria were written for primary use in the context of a clinical trials. But I think most people would agree today, at least from a scientific community standpoint, that these criteria are ready to be utilized in the standard of care practice today. So for example, at Vanderbilt, we use these criteria on every single patient so that in our minds, we know where the patient is on the spectrum of chronic graft versus host disease. So the next sort of big question, I want to focus uh, most of my talk on this, is how do we really make progress? So if you go back to the history, transplant started in the early 1970s. GVHD was recognized uh, in 1955 when people were doing mouse-based transplants before the human transplant started. <clears throat> but we really never understood chronic GVHD really well. And Multiple clinical trials were done over the next two to three decades, and we really did not have a whole lot of progress. I actually made this slide before we had the first FDA-approved drug, which, which I'm going to touch base on in the next few slides, and sort of asked myself the question, if I were to develop a new drug or a new intervention to help um, make a patient with chronic GVHD feel better, how would I do it in a systematic manner? So the three fundamental things. You've got to put the right patient on the right clinical trial. Once the patient is enrolled, you need to have the right tools to measure the effect of your intervention. And then you obviously need the intervention to, be allowed to hit a home run so that you can actually see the effect. To put the things in perspective, do we ever do clinical trials for stage one to four breast cancer using the same drug in the same patient population? Never. So why do we lump all chronic graft versus host disease together, mild, moderate, severe, and try to solve the problem using just the one drug? So as this field advances, I think what we're gonna realize is that a group of patients who have only eye and mouth chronic GVHD are probably a little bit different than somebody who's got liver and stomach graft versus host disease. So why should we attempt to treat both of them with the same medicine? That's our approach today, but science is gradually sort of evolving and we have to sort of start thinking in a different direction. So <clears throat> let's kind of focus on these three bullet points. So putting the right patients on the clinical trials. So we've had, the, um, again, the fortune of t uh, looking at a lot of chronic GVHD patient data, and we are using computerized tools and asking the computer, let's say if I have 100 patients with all varying types of chronic GVHD, to me, they all look the same. I walk into the room, patient's got chronic, somebody's got mouth, somebody's got eyes. But the, the question we're asking the computer is, does a patient who has mouth GVHD what is the likelihood of that same patient getting IGVHD versus skin GVHD? And the computer modeling can predict all of these things. So based on our initial sort of experiments, it looks like there may be as many as seven buckets of chronic graft versus host disease. Again, this is very early. This needs to be sort of uh, 
iterated using thousands of more patients' data, but we essentially will need these kind of approaches to try and figure out how many subtypes of chronic GBHD is. So for example, let's say for a second that these seven categories are truly the seven that are, we're going to have. Then why should I treat category five the same as category one, although we're calling both of them chronic graft versus host disease? So this is where the field will probably need to move. And on the next slide, is, I've got a quote from Albert Einstein, <clears throat> uh, who made a very remarkable and a fundamental observation. He said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I think our approach in chronic GVHD to just bucket it down to mild, moderate, and severe is probably not accurate. And we need to be able to embrace the complexity of the disease and work with the complexity of disease and try and solve every small portion of it until the whole puzzle sort of fits together. So on the next slide, have the right tools to measure the effect. So let's imagine we've got a patient with um, severe chronic GVHD of the lower extremity. The skin is really, really tight. Um, and I start the patient on an experimental drug. How do I measure that the skin is becoming loose? W what questions do I ask the patient? How reliable are those questions? How reliable are the answers? If I ask the patient, if I ask patient number uh, one, is your skin loose on a scale of one to 10? And then I ask the same question to the other patient, uh, is their perception of the skin tightness exactly the same? The answer is no, no, no. So we basically need tools which are patient reported outcomes that have been validated. For example, one of the scales that is more commonly used these days is something called the Lee symptom scale. Again, devised for clinical trials, but should be implemented in the real world. This is a quick questionnaire for the patient, around seven questions that they answer, and if the, if the intervention is working, the symptom scale moves in one direction. If the intervention is not working or the GVHD is getting worse, the symptom scale moves in the other direction. Again, as I mentioned before, the NIH response criteria, these were again devised for clinical trials, these criteria are not perfect. They are not easy to do in the clinic, but I think more and more transplant physicians and transplant programs realize that these are one of the best tools that we have, and it needs to eventually sort of percolate into the standard of care. So again, do question your physicians and say, hey, I know a new drug has been approved and there is talk about Lee symptom scale can I fill out a Lee symptom scale questionnaire? Every, all transplant programs should have it. And some, some of sort of, this is more uh, future thinking. So skin is one of the most common areas of chronic graft versus host disease. So if you look at 100 patients with chronic GBHD, approximately 60 to 70 of those 100 patients will have skin chronic graft versus host disease at some time point during their journey through chronic GBHD. So we can ask these questions. Or the physician can say, how much is the rash? How tight is the skin? Or as I mentioned, we can have a patient reported outcome and say, on a scale of one to 10, how bo bothersome is the skin itching to you? So these are great tools, but the question is, can we do better? So some of the techniques that we are developing at Vanderbilt is, can I take some really high resolution pictures of the skin and ask the computer to tell me how red is red? So think about it from a computer standpoint, for a computer, an image is broken down into its fundamental uh, sort of unit called a pixel. And a computer can analyze one pixel at a time, the entire 10 megabyte image, and give me a quantitative um, number of how red is red. Because what I call red, my colleague may not think that is really red. He may think, no, nah, that's probably less red, that's probably pink. So we need to take away this sort of human bias away from the assessment to chronic GVHD and ask ourselves, can we develop a very objective computerized tool or a methodology to image graft versus host disease and to quantitate graft versus host disease? Because then we can measure the responses really well. Again, 
looking at uh, things of more forward thinking, it would really be nice to have a tool that can measure the tightening of the skin. So we are trying to develop these tools at Vanderbilt that are easy to use in the clinic, um, you know, that are reliable in between patients, that are reliable irrespective of who is operating the tool. The, again, the ideal thing would be, can I do a blood test on a patient today? And the, can the blood test answer for me how much GVHD does a patient have? And these are called biomarkers. They've actually made a very good uh, resurgence into the world of acute graft-versus host disease. Our first biomarker-based acute GVHD clinical trials are all up and running. We do not have the same robust biomarkers in chronic graft-versus host disease, but a lot of really smart scientists today are working on this, and I'm pretty confident that within the next few years, we should be able to sort of crack this puzzle and try and develop biomarkers for chronic graft-versus-host disease. And then the last is having the interventions to lead to the effect being measured. At the end of the day, we may put the right patient on the right study, and we may have the greatest tools, but if the best drug we have is a glass of lemonade, then we're really not making progress. So we need the next sort of generation of drugs. And thankfully for us, <clears throat> Uh, a lot of scientists are sort of working on these kind of things. Now, this is, I've intentionally put this slide over here which says no FDA approved for chronic GVHD, and we know that today ibrutinib is approved. The reason I put this is in order to get a drug FDA approved, you have to go to the FDA. And the FDA says that I need just, you need to prove to me that the drug makes the patient live longer or live better. FDA has a very sim simple motto. Now, we know that patients with chronic GVHD are living a long time, so if I were to start a study of 2000, in 2017 with 100 patients of chronic GVHD, 50 on drug A and 50 on drug B, and both the group of patients are just living for the next 10 years, then I can't prove that the drug is better, that drug A is better or drug B is better. So the next question is, can we prove that the patients are living better? Again, it comes to the world of quality of life. And we make some broad assumptions, sometimes incorrect, that if we make the GVHD respond, that the patient will live longer. Think about it this way. Let's say I have a magic drug, and I give it to a patient, and the GVHD goes away. But in three months, the patient gets an invasive fungal infection and dies. Did that drug work or not work? If I answered my question on week four when the patient had no GVHD, I would have declared victory. But if I look at the patient three months later when the patient has, is deceased from a fungal infection, that drug was useless. So we have to be very careful when we approve drugs only based on response and we do not look at what we call competing risk of relapse of the underlying disease or infectious deaths. We also make a big assumption that just because a patient responds, they have a better quality of life. Usually that's true, but we cannot take that for granted. The third aspect is just because a patient lives longer, we cannot make an assumption that the patient has a better quality of life. So as we are devising clinical trials, we have to keep all of these attributes in mind so that we've got the right clinical trial design and we are approving drugs that are meaningful to the patient, that they are feeling better and they are living longer. So the pharmaceutical industry obviously needed a path forward. Thankfully, the NIH had developed all the response metrics. Dr. Stephanie Lee's team had developed the Lee symptom scale. So the stars started sort of getting slowly aligned. And thankfully, again for us, there is no shortage of targets. We know the molecules that are misbehaving in chronic graft-versus-host disease. And in today's day and age, once we know the culprit molecule and we know the pathway, Designing a drug to inhibit that pathway is not very tough. It will take three to four years to have your perfect designer drug, a couple of years of clinical trials, but the, I think our speed of discovery 
is going to get faster and faster as science is making progress. And I think we're going to have more FDA-approved drugs within the next several years in the world of chronic graft-versus-host disease. So I'm going to switch gears now and uh, move to uh, some of the clinical trials that have led to an FDA approval or clinical trials that I've had a um, uh, you know, fortune of sort of being involved in. So FDA approved ibrutinib for chronic graft-versus-host disease for patients that have failed at least one line of treatment. And the first line of treatment, whether we like it or not, is unfortunately still corticosteroids or prednisone or steroids as we call it today. So patients who have failed one line of therapy were enrolled on this clinical trial um, and uh, got FDA approval. I'm going to show you just one slide on why the FDA approved it. So this study was approximately 42 patients. 24 had skin, another 24 patients had mouth, 11 patients had liver, three patients had, uh, sorry, 11 patients had GI and three patients had liver. When you add up the numbers, the numbers don't add up to be 42 because one patient could have had multiple organ involvement. But if you look at skin, 88% of the patients with skin involvement had a response in the skin. What that means is either the skin completely normalized or had 50% improvement or what we call partial response. Same for mouth, 88%, GI was 91%, liver was 67%. So 80% of patients with two or more organ involved at baseline responded in at least two organs. So if somebody had three organ involvement, 80% chance that they would respond in at least two or three organs and similarly, 56% with three or more organs involved at baseline responded in at least three organs. So what this shows is that ibrutinib works in not only these four target organs, but it also works in patients where the same patient has multiple organ involvement. So it's, that's a, one of the reasons it's got FD approved. The other reason is it is very safe. There is a small risk of infections that your doctors may need to manage, but overall a very safe drug. If a patient responds, they can hopefully cut down their steroids and cyclosporin or tacrolimus or sirolimus or celsep by significant doses. So your total burden of immunosuppression goes down. And if a patient responds, Many of these patients maintain that response for seven months and nine months. Again, the long-term data is continuing to accumulate. So if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, uh, the website where all these um, you know, clinical trials are posted, uh, these are the two important clinical trials that are going on. This is first-line chronic GVHD. That means a new diagnosis of chronic GVHD and both of these are randomized studies, which means 50% of the group will get steroids along with the sugar pill, and 50% of the group will get steroids along with the investigational agent. In this case, the first trial is based with ibrutinib, and the second trial, it's a drug called entospletinib, uh, which is uh, both of these trials are currently ongoing. I think they've accrued a uh, few patients in the 30s and 40s, and I think this is still a few years away from giving us a clean answer if ibrutinib is better than corticosteroids uh, in frontline chronic graft versus host disease. <clears throat> this is another exciting drug that I've had an opportunity to uh, work with. Um, currently, it just has a number, and it's called KD025. And again, it is designed for patients with chronic GVHD who have failed at least one line of therapy and who have not used up more than three lines of therapy, so between one to three lines of therapy. And this data was presented at the American Society of Hematology conference this is past weekend, and this was a poster at the conference, so this is all in the public domain on the American Society of Hematology website. And as you can see over here, at the first data cutoff, the overall response rate was 65% in cohort one, and these patients got a dose of 200 milligram once a day, and was 63% in cohort two, and these patients got a dose of 200 milligrams two times a day. 
On the right-hand panel, you can basically see all the various organ domains. So if, people had, if patients had more than two organs involved, 59% of the patients responded in at least two organs, 50% in cohort two. Um, the panel on the lower right is the corticosteroid dose. And again, uh, it basically shows that as time is going on, both in cohort one and cohort two, the dose of the steroid keeps on coming down, suggesting that when these kind of drugs start working in an individual patient, we can drop the dose of the steroid down significantly. And many of you may have been on steroids or are on steroids, and I can tell you, none of my patients like their prednisone. So it's really important that we should be able to taper prednisone with all these new uh, agents. So again, I hope I've sort of convinced you in, in the big scheme of things that the only way to make progress is to participate in clinical trials. And from a scientific standpoint, from our standpoint, the three things that we have, the three principles that we have to obey is put the right patients on the right study, have the right tools to measure the effects, and have the interventions that lead to the effect being uh, measured. And the way I would sort of conceptualize is that for the field of chronic graft versus host disease, the stars are finally getting aligned. All these three fundamental principles have taken a long time in the making. We had to have the NIH criteria. We needed to understand how to subset the patients of chronic GVHD. The scientists had to make the progress to identify the molecules. The pharmaceutical industry had to get engaged to develop these drugs, but I think that that era has now uh, arrived. This is sort of my one of my favorite slides. This is basically telling us that every day as the Earth rotates, there is a dawn of a new era. So there is a lot of hope today for patients with chronic graft versus host disease much more than there was five years ago. And as a physician, as a transplant physician, as a physician taking care of chronic GVHD, I'm more excited today than I ever was that we should be able to solve this problem. And I would like, just like to acknowledge um, that these kind of um, progress are just massive team efforts. This is not one physician and one transplant program. So the NIH had funded, um, through their Office of Rare Clinical Disease Research Network, the Chronic GVHD Consortium approximately uh, now 12 years ago. So we are a group of academic centers that work together, and our sole purpose is to improve the outcome of chronic GVHD, both as a response, as survival, as quality of life, so that we are then able to you know, make the patients feel better. And more at a local le level at Vanderbilt, this is not just the work of you know, one physician. Just because I'm on the webinar doesn't mean that I've done this all. These are all team efforts. I've got phenomenal colleagues, phenomenal scientists that I'm fortunate to work with, funding from our cancer center, the vision to develop a long-term transplant clinic. So it, it really takes uh, a lot of effort behind the scenes to move uh, this field forward. And I'm just going to uh, end over here. This is uh, Nashville. Uh, keeps on changing uh, every few years. So if you've not visited Nashville, uh, do stop by sometime. And I'm going to stop there and turn it over back to Sue. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Jagesha. That was a very interesting presentation. And I think, at least for me, provides some hope that we are moving in the right direction. And might be able to tackle this beast uh, better in, in the near future. Uh, we are now open for questions and answers. If you have a question, please do type it in the chat box in the lower left, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, do understand that, um, in general, Dr. Chigesha will be able to answer some questions that are specific to you, but there is no substitute for knowing your full medical history, um, so he may not be able to answer in as great a detail as you would like um, with, without that kind of background. So to begin with, David has asked, is the best therapy for late-stage bronchiolitis obliterans secondary to GVHD 
still include monoculast, azithromycin, and Advair discus, or are there better, newer regimens? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question. <clears throat> um, bronchiolitis obliterans um, is a manifestation of chronic GVHD that affects the lungs. Um, we are still trying to understand that disease. The combination of drugs that you mentioned actually originated from the world of lung transplant and seemed to have some sort of efficacy. We, we did a randomized study with the GVHD consortium and were able to show mild activity, but not anywhere close to a home run. Um, both the Ibrutinib study and now the Cadman KD025 study, as long as you are eligible for those clinical trials, I think it's worth a shot. Now, in, um, in, the, in the Pharmacyclics Ibrutinib study, um, patients with lung GVHD were included some of them had a mild response. Um, on the KD025 study, again, if you're eligible, it is worth considering. The other sort of off-label use um, is a photophoresis. Um, I did not touch on that in this talk. Photophoresis has been very effective in treatment of chronic graft-versus-host disease, and at least in our uh, experience here at Vanderbilt, uh, we have had some patients get a response uh, to photophoresis, downside of photophoresis is that's an invasive procedure, requires a line to be placed, multiple trips to the <laughs> transplant center, but I think patients with advanced bronchiolitis obliterans, it, it's worth a try. But again, sort of discuss that with your physician and, and see what their recommendations are in your specific case. And I think you covered just covered this in your answer, but I'll just pose it again in case you have anything more to add. Anne wants to know if Ibrutinib has had any effect on bronchiolitis obliterans. Um, as I said, in the clinical trials that they conducted, there was a mild improvement, uh, but the study was never designed to specifically ask that question. The study was enrolling patients with all types of chronic GVHD. Some patients had lung, and there was a, some signal that it may improve. Okay, Robert wants to know how how effective has Ibrutinib been <clears throat> excuse me, regarding ocular GVHD with extreme dry eye and blepharitis? Yeah, so it's a very good question again. Again, as, as I mentioned in my, uh, in my opening slides, right, chronic GVHD is like 10 different diseases <clears throat> that we unfortunately have to use one name. So when Ibrutinib was used in the clinical trial setting, it included patients who had a red skin and a red mouth. Now, some of them had a dry, an advanced dry eye. To the best of my knowledge, there was not a significant improvement with a very advanced ocular graft versus host disease. Some patients reported a mild improvement, but the drug is FDA-approved, and it is FDA-approved. If you look at the package insert, it, does not, it basically says <coughs> FDA-approved for chronic GVHD that has failed one line of therapy. So again, the drug is relatively safe, and if your uh, physician feels that it is worth a try uh, with Ibrutinib to see if the eyes respond, uh, it, it may be worth a discussion. Thomas is asking, uh, I have chronic GVHD in all organs listed in Dr. Jagesh's presentation. When my oncologist tapered me off prednisone, the GVHD finally affected the lungs quite severely. I am now back on 10 milligrams of prednisone as well as 15 milligrams of Jacophy daily. He is considering tapering me off prednisone while introducing a CELSEPT regimen. What do you think of this strategy? Yeah, this, is, this I think is a complex uh, scenario. Again, uh, reach out to your physician. Uh, I think there is a small group of patients in my practice where I'm getting fairly convinced that those patients do need a very small dose of prednisone indefinitely. For some reason, their body is not ready to give up the last five, six, seven milligrams of prednisone. There has been a study of um, cyclosporin steroids, placebo versus cyclosporin steroids and CELCEPT, and that was a negative study. My personal bias is that CELCEPT is not a terribly effective drug in bronchiolitis obliterans. Uh, so again, something to discuss with your physician, but I, I, would, I, would, I would not be sort of too gung-ho about adding CELCEP to taper prednisone unless there are significant prednisone side effects at that low dose of 10 milligrams. 
Chizzy is asking, how long do you wait to evaluate the, the effect of a medication? Brilliant question. <clears throat> it's a very nice question. I think a lot depends upon which organ is involved. If you've got a red skin, red mouth with inflammation and ulcers, if that's not getting better within two to three months, I would say you're probably on the wrong drug. On the other extreme, if somebody's got lung GVHD, I would definitely give it six, nine, 12 months to see if the lungs are stabilizing with repeated pulmonary function tests. If the skin is tight and sclerotic, uh, again, you have to give a trial of four to six months to see if something is gonna work or not working. Obviously, it has to be balanced with your risk of the drug that you're taking. If it is at a very high dose, is the patient getting repeated infections, repeated hospitalization? So there are multiple things that go in to uh, allow the physician to then take sort of a more holistic view and say, when should I assess the patient and see whether this drug is working or not? But that is a very valid question, and that's a question uh, that comes up repeatedly in clinical trials as to when do you say, the drug is working, and when do you give up on a drug? Rebecca would like to know whether you have seen or heard of GVHD in the bladder. That's a very good question. I have seen GVHD of the <coughs> urethra, that is um, basically the canal that connects the bladder to either the penis or the urethral meatus in, in females. Um, of the bladder itself, I cannot say that I have uh, seen that. Uh, if that diagnosis is being entertained, we need to be very sure that there are no, nothing else going on like BK cystitis, hemorrhagic cystitis, interstitial cystitis. Those are other diseases that could mimic graft versus host disease uh, in the bladder. I don't think bladder is a common site. Now, if the GVHD started in the urethra, and spread into the bladder neck, that is certainly feasible, but I can't say I've seen a patient with bladder graft versus host disease. Patricia, <clears throat> excuse me, Patricia would like to know whether you're familiar with invasive graft versus host disease. Um, I don't think we use that terminology uh, very commonly. Um, I would like to know invading which organ, unless we are referring to fasciitis with this GVHD of the soft tissue around the muscles. Um, that, that's not a <clears throat> commonly used uh, terminology. Bruce would like to know what the definition is for steroid failure for GVHD. Brilliant question again, something that we struggle with all the time. Um, I think these days the definition of steroid refractory or steroid failure is, <clears throat> so for example, in the KD025 study, that it's been defined as the patient should have been on steroids for at least two months with worsening of GVHD or no improvement or significant steroid complications that preclude the continued use of steroids. To me, and, and I think to a patient, it's like I've given it a reasonable try. It's not working. I'm not feeling better. I'm getting side effects. This drug is not right for me, hence it is steroid failure. So I think we've got to keep it in the context of the patient as well. Some patient may be able to tolerate 20 of prednisone, but for another patient who's got underlying diabetes, 20 of prednisone means a sugar of 400, to that patient, that, that is not a tolerant dose. Okay, Jeff <clears throat> said, I'm now five years plus after transplant. <clears throat> Excuse me. My GVHD was mild to moderate for the first two years. It is currently severe. How often have you seen a trajectory like this? Yeah, that's, that's actually not uh, very uncommon. It also depends upon uh, which organs were mild and moderate and which organ is affected by severe. <clears throat> Sometimes an intercurrent viral infection will become the tipping point. I've seen several patients who were mild or moderate in the months of October, November, get a bad influenza. Influenza excites the immune system, and those patients' organs move into severe chronic GVHD. Uh, that can happen. Uh, Sangamitra asked, is there anything a patient with acute GVHD 
can do to proactively reduce his or her chance of getting chronic GVHD? Yeah, br brilliant question again. Uh, these are exactly the questions that as a scientist we are trying to sort of address. Uh, currently the answer is no, um, but I think over the next several years I think that answer will probably become a yes. We just need to figure out when a patient gets acute graft versus host disease, which pathway to chronic GVHD has been activated. It's probably not the same pathway in every patient, because if it was, then all patients would get exactly the same type of chronic GVHD, which we know is not the case. So it's very likely that some patients who get acute GVHD accelerate their pathways towards skin and eye GVHD. Once we understand that, then we would be able to develop some preemptive strategies. Okay, Laura says, I was told that Imbrutinib was not a safe treatment for me because I have long QT. Is extracorporeal photophoresis or Jacophy a good option for fasciitis, oral, and skin GVHD? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. Imbrutinib does have some warnings around arrhythmias and long QT syndrome, so your, your physician is absolutely on the mark for that. If you've got fasciitis, sclerosis, um, Jacophy, uh, in terms of prospective clinical trials for chronic GVHD, are just getting underway. There are some pretty um, good uh, publications that Jacophy may have a role in chronic GVHD, but these are all retrospective st uh, studies, and I'm always a little bit sort of skeptical about retrospective studies. We need to do it in the context of a prospective clinical trial. Uh, photophoresis, I think, is a very real option especially for sclerotic GVHD and fasciitis, I've actually seen photophoresis work remarkably well in, in that group of patients. Okay, Jeremy says, I have GVHD of the skin for two years, a response to steroids, but I have chronic kidney disease. Would abrutinib be safe for kidney? Um, I, I believe so in the sense that um, I don't remember off the top of my head a creatinine cutoff. I think uh, we have used it up to a creatinine of two, two and a half. Uh, so I think it is reasonable, but you, we may want to sort of check in with your physician or the physician needs to check in with the pharmacist or the PharmD in the clinic with the transplant team to see what dose is safe. My recollection is that you need a dose modification, but it can be used. Um, I think you may have already addressed this, but I'll ask it anyways. Tom says, I'm 10 years post-transplant for AML. I have GVHD in the mouth and eyes. I'm currently down to one milligram prednisone daily. Will the GVHD ever burn out, or am I destined to take steroids forever? What are the long-term yeah. effects at one milligram daily? Yeah, so, so again, a multi-pronged question over here. I think the first question we got to answer is, the GVHD that you have in the mouth or eyes, is it active or is it residual damage? If it is residual damage, that means dry mouth, dry eyes, but no new ulcerations, no redness, then I think you should be able to come off that one milligram of steroids. If your physician feels that there is some activity, then I would say stay on that one milligram. If one milligram is keeping sort of uh, the boat afloat, then don't rock that boat. On a different note, do you need that one milligram uh, sort of, you know, lifelong? So remember, our body endogenously by itself makes around four to five milligrams of prednisone a day. If we did not have prednisone in our body, we would not feel well. And our adrenal glands do that job. So if and when your physician is ready to taper you off that last one milligram, you should ideally have a blood test called a cortisol stimulation test to make sure your adrenal gland is up and ready to make the four or five milligrams of prednisone that the body needs before you come off that one milligram. And typically, at least in our practice, our endocrinologists help us sort of get the patients off the last few milligram of prednisone when we as transplant physicians feel that the GVHD does not require that small dose of prednisone. Okay, Ryan says, doctors are very busy and it's important for patients to own their own health and care to some extent, i.e. not being a passive participant in the healthcare system. What are the top two or three places, websites, publications, or other resources for GVHD patients and their families to find out about new research, clinical trials, new therapies, or treatment approaches, which they can potentially discuss with their doctors? 
Yeah, so it's a very good question. So I think, um, one, I completely agree um, uh, that patients need to own their gr chronic GVHD management and should never, ever be a sort of just a, just a passive, uh, you know, uh, person in, in, in this sort of dialogue. So uh, thank you for saying that. Uh, in terms of resources, obviously, uh, BMT InfoNet is a great resource. Clinicaltrials.gov is an NIH-sponsored resource. It's like any other search engine. Just type the words chronic graft versus host disease. You can filter by your area, by your zip code, by the radius of where you are living, and it will tell you which uh, hospitals have clinical trials in, in that area. You can always call clinicaltrials.gov, give them your address, and say, I'm, I'm trying to access GVHD studies. The other option is go to Be The Match. Uh, Be The Match, or NMDP, previously known as that, uh, has very good resources uh, as well. Um, the Chronic GVHD Consortium has a website that is uh, funded by the NIH as well. We try to keep it as updated as we can. Uh, the 15-ish or so Chronic GVHD Consortium centers are all sort of leading academic centers. Uh, that have an interest in chronic GVHD. If those centers are in your vicinity, do try and access them. I think it is worth, uh, irrespective of the program where you got transplanted, uh, if they are not, you know, if, if you get a sense that they are not kind of providing the latest cutting edge, it is worth getting a one-time consult at least at one of these academic centers to make sure that what your physician is doing is aligned with kind of where the thought leaders are thinking about this. So a variety of tools are available, uh, but I completely agree that patients should be asking the doctors, and that's the reason I was emphasizing in my talk, ask the doctors about your NIH stage and grade, ask the doctors about Lee symptom scale, ask the doctors whether <clears throat> they're using NIH response criteria. So keep your physicians on their toes as well. And I might add that on the BMT InfoNet website under the tab Transplant Basics, there is a section on chronic graft versus host disease, which we update continuously. So check there or feel free to call us at the, the toll-free number, which is 888-597-7674. Marlon would like to know how long it takes for a brutinib to show some results. I've been on it for five months with little results. I'm dealing yeah, with scleroderma, mouth sores, upper GI. I've had photophoresis for six months. I'm now in treatment with, with phototherapy. 40 sessions with little result? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so I, I think a lot depends upon, even if you're not seeing a response, <clears throat> um, the question is, were you able to come off some of your other immunosuppression, i.e. steroids or tacrolimus? If ibrutinib is able to get you off your other immunosuppressants, despite not having a response, I think it is a reasonable stabilization of disease. Um, sounds like you have advanced uh, chronic graft versus host disease. Again, the other thing that I would recommend is if you are eligible for the KD025 study or in the vicinity of a center that's offering that clinical trial, I think that is uh, worth, worth investigating into that. Mindy says, I had an ELA transplant in the fall of 2008. I'm still bothered with dry eyes. My eye doc does not see any GVHD at this point. Do you think dry eyes will ever go away? That's a very good question. Again, again, a very disabling complication of uh, ocular graft versus host disease. Current data suggests that around 40 to 50 percent of patients with chronic GVHD will have a dry eye. Um, I, I never like to use the words ever and never. Um, currently, do I have a drug that makes the dry eye go away? The answer is no. Uh, will there ever be a drug that will be able to sort of, you know, sort of revive the lacrimal gland and the tear ducts to sort of start producing tears, I surely hope so. Uh, you probably need to see an ophthalmologist who, or who's a cornea specialist. These are types of the eye doctors who specialize in dry eye. There are a lot of tricks up their sleeve like autologous serum tears, uh, scleral lenses, uh, prose lenses that can be used to decrease some of the impact on the quality of life. So it may not address the root cause of ocular GVHD, but clearly can help you sort of feel better. Sue would like to know what you suggest if you get severe side effects from prednisone. 
That's a good question again. I think a lot depends upon what those side effects are. Um, most of the side effects tend to be dose related. If you decrease the dose, the side effects should decrease, especially things like tremors, mood swings, uh, diabetes, hypertension, they are dose related. Some of them are not dose related. For example, uh, skin fragility, easy bruising. Uh, some patients will do that on five milligram. Some will do it on 10 milligram. Some side effects can become irreversible, especially the joint side effects like osteoporosis, compression fractures, avascular necr necrosis. But if a patient is running into rather significant steroid side effects, I think e either the doctor should come up with a strategy to address that specific side effect or then come up with an, um, sort of a plan of how best to decrease the prednisone and what other steroid sparing agent can be added. Andrea would like to know if you've seen GVHD of the brain. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it, it has been reported. Uh, it does not have necessarily sort of a clear definition to it. Uh, some patients re report intractable headaches. Some patients have had uh, arachnoiditis. I, I don't think we um, call it necessarily scientifically GVHD of the brain. We know that there can be some uh, Im abnormal immune responses in the brain, but it's extremely, extremely rare, and it's really not been well characterized. Sorry, cannot give you a better answer. Erwin would like to know, how do you treat hearing loss from GVHD? That should not be a direct consequence of graft versus host disease, unless a patient has had repeated ear infections because of the immune system being compromised. To the best of my knowledge, GVHD should not have impact on the auditory nerve, that at least I have not seen that in my 20 years. Mary Lou would like to know, is vaginal atrophy a GVHC symptom, and what can be done to improve this symptom? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. As, as I mentioned, genitourinary GVHD is underreported and very underestimated. <clears throat> uh, vaginal changes due to chronic GVHD uh, can be very heterogeneous. Sometimes it can mimic postmenopausal vaginal atrophy. So you need to see a gynecologist who needs to s figure out is it because of hormonal imbalance postmenopausal status, or truly because of chronic GVHD. In most patients, vaginal atrophy can be addressed with a hormone replacement, either systemically in the form of a pill or just sort of, you know, topically by creams or gels applied uh, in, in the vagina. Um, sometimes they don't respond to hormones and you need a tiny bit of immunosuppression but you need to see a gynecologist who is an expert in uh, sort of vaginal graft versus host disease. And, and there is a specialist, uh, at least at the NIH, by the name of Dr. Pam Stratton. She's absolutely phenomenal. There are not too many gynecologists in the country that are really, really good in chronic GVHD. Sherry would like to know whether you've treated patients with neurological GVHD, specifically CIDP. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Neurologic manifestations of GVHD, again, are rare, but I've um, uh, actually seen several with either myasthenia gravis, uh, CIDP, myositis type of uh, chronic GVHD. These tend to be really challenging. <clears throat> so the first question we ask when the patient has CIDP is, does this just happen to be CIDP in a patient who has chronic GVHD, or is the CIDP related to the chronic GVHD, and if it is related, two questions come up. Does treating the chronic GVHD treat the CIDP, or do you need a specific treatment? I think in the limited number of cases that I have with CIDP, the GVHD treatment often does not work for the CIDP, and you need to go down the pathway of CIDP, which is typically rituxin, steroid-based treatments, plasmapheresis has been tried, and, and you really need an expert neurologist to work with your transplant physician to make all those distinctions. That, that is a very challenging case. Uh, Jeff, who currently has GVHD of the eyes, mouth, skin, and GI tract, wants to know if there have been any studies of probiotics in managing the effects of treatments for GVHD. 
Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of data emerging that the bacteria that we carry in our GI tract has a huge impact on our immune system. I don't think the science has evolved whether these bacteria impact acute and chronic GVHD the way they respond. Um, my, my gut instinct, no pun intended, that, that it will be connected. How does probiotic change that? Um, I don't think we're ready to answer that question yet, but if you're not on a lot of immunosuppression, um, I'm personally in, in favor of probiotics. I don't think they're gonna hurt us. These are bacteria that we already have in our GI tract. Taking a few million more should not hurt us, but again, clearly a discussion with your physician. Different physicians have different views on probiotics in the, in the context of an immunosuppressed patient. Okay, Rebecca asks, I am a nurse practitioner for our center in post-BMT clinic. I see our PEDS patients after they've returned from the transplant center. I want to know if you could just offer some advice for providers when seeing very fresh transplant children. I should say specifically oncology patients who had failed conventional treatment and went to transplant. Yes, it's a very good question. I think as an advanced practitioner, I would say that you definitely need to be formally educated in the field of graft versus host disease. I'm not a pediatric transplanter, so I'm going to say stay a little bit silent on that, but I think the, fu the fundamental principles of an advanced practitioner in a post-BMT clinic is the same. This takes time, energy, and effort to learn this field. Uh, American Society of Bone Marrow Transplantation has phenomenal resources. There are uh, nurse practitioner, physician assistant based conferences that are happening across the country two to three times a year to train nurse practitioners. Uh, if you've not had an opportunity to go to the ASBMT International Conference, I think it's coming up in February 21st to 25th in the Salt Lake City. There is a dedicated physician assistant nurse practitioner symposium. It is very well run. So if you are a dedicated APP assigned to the post-BMT clinic, please, please, please tell your uh, physician or your uh, manager to give you that opportunity to get educated at these conferences. It is absolutely worth the investment. David would like to know what the success rate is for lung transplants for bronchiolitis obliterans secondary to GVHD. Yeah, yeah, uh, a really, uh, again, a very good question. Again, most of these are anecdotes. Uh, there have been uh, several case series that have been published now. Um, I think the timing of lung transplant in bronchiolitis obliterans is critical. Can do it too early because at the end of the day, it's a surgical procedure, you're in more immunosuppression, and can, should not do it too late when the patient is physically so debilitated that the risk of surgery outweighs the benefit. Um, I think this needs to be a crosstalk between the stem cell transplant physician and the lung transplant uh, surgeon and the pulmonologist to try and figure out what is the right time. Can it be done? The answer is yes. Can the transplanted lung remain happy uh, with somebody else's stem cells in the body in a recipient? The answer is yes. But again, these are rare and probably reach out to uh, academic centers that have a large volume of lung transplants. They're going to be the experts at this question. Thomas would like to know whether GVHD can cause peripheral neuropathy. Yes, GVHD can cause peripheral neuropathy, but before you blame it on graft versus host disease, you've got to make sure that none of the concomitant medicines that a patient is taking is contributing to that. For example, Cyclosporin and tacrolimus can cause peripheral neuropathy. Depending upon what disease the patient got transplanted for, if patient had myeloma and had got Velcade, Velcade can cause neuropathy. If the patient had ALL and got Vincristine, Vincristine can cause neuropathy. So before we blame it on the GVHD, we have to rule out all the other confounding variables. But the answer is yes, that it can do that. Uh, Chizzy would like to know what the effect of abrutinib is on scleral dermal GVHD. Correct. So uh, sclerotic GVHD is known to respond to abrutinib. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but in the range of 30 to 35% of patients will have some sort of a response to sclerotic GVHD. 
So, so it works in sclerotic GBHD. They just wish it worked at a, at a larger percentage. Uh, Rebecca said, do you find that the longer chronic GBHD goes undiagnosed and untreated, the harder it is to treat and the patient is less likely to outgrow it, as my doctor has phrased it? Uh, I think that is probably a true statement. Um, I think um, the, the transplant clinics at the various uh, hospitals need to do a good job of diagnosing chronic GVHD as soon as it sets in. There is no reason today why a diagnosis of chronic GVHD should be missed. If the patient is following at their parent transplant institute, those doctors should be very well versed in it. Now, if you uh, got transplanted at one center and are following up with just your local primary care doctor or a general practitioner or a, or a local community oncologist who has never undergone transplant training, then that becomes a setup for missing the diagnosis and mislabeling it with a variety of disorders until somebody sort of puts the, all the, uh, you know, connects all the dots together. Anne would like to know whether there's been any, any success in treating chronic GVHD with rituximab? Yes, the answer is yes. There's been a phase two study of rituximab and chronic GVHD, and it gives rise to a pretty reasonable response rate of 40% plus. One of the drawbacks of rituximab is that once the levels of rituximab in the blood go down, the GVHD tends to sort of recur again, but a small number of patients will get uh, long-lasting relief with rituxan. And Marlon says, I've been on Ibrutinib for five months with little results. The doctors consider considering trying in, Intimab. What are your thoughts? Right, it's a good question. So uh, Ibrutinib for five months and now considering Imatinib or Gleevec. So we had done a study of Gleevec versus Rituximab, and if the patients failed either one, then they crossed over to the other arm. It was not a very positive study, and the response rate with Gleevec was in the range of 15 to 20%, so definitely not a, a home run. Uh, again, as I mentioned to the other patient, if you've been on Ibrutinib for five months but have been able to come off some of your other Im immunosuppressive agents, I would consider that stabilization of disease and don't give up on Ibrutinib. The other option is if you're in the vicinity of a center where they're running the KD-025 study, that is another clinical trial option that you have. Rose is asking, I'm seven months post-transplant and off immunosuppressants. I know GVHD can occur at any time, but am I less likely to get it the longer I go with no symptoms? Yes, the answer to that is yes. The median time to onset of chronic GVHD is approximately month seven to month eight after transplant, and especially the highest risk period is within the first few months of coming off immunosuppression. So the longer you go since you have stopped immunosuppression and you don't get chronic GVHD, you are less likely to get chronic GVHD later on. And Bruce would like to know whether headaches can be associated with GVHD. Uh, directly, probably not. Indirectly, probably yes, because of dry eyes, recurrent sinusitis, recurrent ear infection. Does GVHD by itself cause headaches? I don't think I have seen that ever. Um, so, but again, I've not, not really deeply thought about that either. And Sherry has a follow-up question to one she asked earlier, saying, in regards to the onset of CIDP, is it appropriate to ask my doctor which pathway has been activated to understand better? No, I, I think what you need to ask your doctor, Sherry, is that do you think that I have CIDP as a standalone diagnosis, or do you think I have CIDP because of chronic GVHD? Those are the two paths that we need to sort of think it through. If the answer is we don't think the GVHD is associated with CIDP, you just have CIDP, then you need to get treated for that. If the doctor feels that the chronic GVHD and the CIDP are linked together, and the next question you've got to ask yourself is, does treatment of the underlying chronic GVHD help me resolve the CIDP? Uh, in terms of pathway, I think I referred to another question, um, is like which cellular pathway? I, I don't think we have the science quite yet as to which exact group of cells are misbehaving to lead to CIDP. Jeremy would like to know how you would transition from Celsep to Ibrutinib. 
Uh, is this in the context of chronic graft versus host disease? Like, a, like you have uh, chronic GVHD? I, um, I believe I would, so. Yeah. So if you have GVHD and you are on CELSEPT and you want to transition to ibrutinib um, and your doctor feels that that is the right intervention, then you stop the CELSEPT cold turkey. If they are worried that you may flare up, taper it over a few week period and then have a washout for at least five to seven days where you're not on any cell sept and then start a brood net. And I think a similar question from Chizzy, can you cross taper between immunologic therapies, for example, Jacophy to Ibrutinib? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, one, I would not use Jacophy and Ibrutinib at the same time. There is very, very limited to no data on what that combination does. So be very cautious about having Jacophy going down, Ibrutinib going up at the same time. I would personally feel uh, more comfortable tapering a patient off Jacophy completely, uh, fairly quickly, a few days washout, five to seven days, and then start your new drug. I would not do Ibrutinib and Jacophy at the same time as of yet. Once there is more scientific data, we may have a little bit of a different comfort level. And we're getting towards the end here. Jeff would like to know, is there a known relationship between GVHD and sleep apnea? That is a good question. Um, I have not seen a correlation between GVHD and sleep apnea. Now, if somebody's had a lot of steroids, has developed abdominal obesity, uh, and then is developing sleep apnea or has bronchiolitis obliterans, but GVHD should not directly be causing sleep apnea. And then our last question from David is, without a reliable biomarker for chronic GVHD, how is the efficacy of ibrutinib measured? So currently it is being measured uh, using just the NIH response criteria. So we are uh, looking at the patient, examining the patient, scoring the patient using the least symptom scale, and if all the scores move in the right direction, we are calling that a response. Uh, the biomarkers for response association, uh, I think we are still a few years away from that. Our first set of biomarkers that we want to really develop real quickly is, so think about it this way, at day 100, can I run a blood test that tells me what are the odds of getting GVHD in the next six months and which organ is it going to show up in? That would be hugely beneficial. But the biomarker for response is probably going to be uh, after that. All right. Well, we actually are ending right on time. Great presentation, Dr. Chikesha. I know it stimulated a lot of thought and conversation among our listeners, and uh, thank you, listeners, for all of the wonderful questions that you posed. If you have any other questions about GVHD or any other aspect of transplant, we encourage you to reach out to BMT Infonet either through our website, bmtinfonet.org, or by phoning us toll-free at 888 888- Five nine seven seven six seven four. You can always email us at well, as well at help at bmtinfonet.org. So uh, again, let me thank Dr. Jagesha for a wonderful presentation and Pharmacyclics and Janssen who generously supported this webinar. Good night, everyone, and have a wonderful